So I want to ask Dr. Steve Pachinik, who uh, obviously was head of psychological operations at the State Department, works in other agencies, one of the co-founders of General Boykin Schumacher of Delta Force. I want to get his take just on the state of the union right now before we get into topics he wants to cover, because we don't, you know, pre-script these live interviews. For me, Trump's over-delivering, very impressive. Uh, I'm really worried about him. They're selling a narrative of assassination and coup and how great that's going to be in the New York Times and HBO. I mean, it's just everywhere. And I'm really concerned uh, that 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 they uh, they have an attitude like they've got something big planned and they're not giving up uh, in the face of just prosperity and Americana. So I want to get your view on the current uh, developments and so far what you think of uh, President Trump. Well, I think he has delivered exactly what we expected him to deliver, what you and I have been talking about for 12 years or more. And that is he's brought a businessman's perspective to the running of government. It's been over 100 years since we've had a businessman. And the only one was Hoover, quite frankly. But what you're seeing now is the quietest, most effective revolution that you, I, and my fellow consorts, doesn't matter who they are, implemented through the ascendancy of Trump and his family. Trump doesn't need to do this. His family doesn't need to do this. What he is doing is exactly what I do or others do in the business community. We come in, we clear out an institution in ASAP time. That means you don't have a chance to protest or any time to uh, to, rip, to to drive an anti-defamation. The Kabuki theater is over. The man of action's here. That's correct. And I, I think what he what I I think everybody has to understand the state of the union is fine. We're not in a civil war. Number one, there is no civil war initiated by the left or the press. What's happening is. You're hearing the girdling of a dying institution, both in the media and in the left wing. But you agree that they are trying to sell an a uprising? Well, they can sell whatever they want, but they can't mimic or ape what you and I and a group of others have done very quietly, very sotto voce, what we effectively did way before that they had any idea that was coming in. And actually, we have to thank Hillary for being so incompetent, as well as her $100 million coterie. Of oh, that's right. We shouldn't be too arrogant. We were facing massive incompetence. Oh, my God. On the contrary, I want to thank Hillary. I want to thank the uh, Dewey Square group. I want to thank all of those who were paid off and were totally, completely incompetent. Every Democrat, every newspaper, and every piece of content that had a narrative that was a kumbaya narrative. Isn't it their arrogance that made America finally reject them? Well, it's not only their arrogance. It really is, uh, Alex, as you and I know, competency. You and I share, as we do with millions of Americans, we're small business people. We're anything but close to 500 million. As if we don't fact, show up, the donuts don't get made. Well, we, that's correct. I mean, that's a great way to say it. But honestly, we're not bankers. We're not VCs. We're not sycophants. We're not parasites. What you have seen is the end of an era of parasites. And Trump knows that. You would come on 10 years ago and say, we need farmers. We need ranchers. We need auto part producers. We need working people building a world about people. Trump gets that. It's not about robots. It's not about, he's making it about people again. The globalists wanted to demoralize us and control us. Trump gets that it's about giving people satisfaction of being self-sufficient again. You hit it on the head, Alex. You and I talked about it. I, I wrote a blog years ago that the greatest national security problem we have in the United States is not our debt. It's not even ISIS. It's the fact that family farmers are less than 6% of our country. No one is going into the family farm business because it's too hard. I have friends who work 18 hour days, seven days a week. We don't see that in the upper crust. We don't see that in the Hillary's. We don't see that in the Washington Post. I don't see that in the bankers at Goldman Sachs or Lloyd Blankfein, who comes in and defies an order on immigration. But we are seeing 18 hour days out of Trump. He, that's not a put on. He literally uh, is a machine. Uh, you're actually, I'm, I'm very impressed. And as a physician, I'm a little bit worried about a man who's a little bit younger than myself, who has this kind of energy, goes 18 hours a day, seven days a week. I was about to say, though, I mean, he's the oldest president ever elected. 
Well, he, and he may be the oldest in terms of age, but he is the youngest in terms of attitude. No, I agree. Ethos and eagerness. Yeah, I mean, I hate, to, I, mean yes. I hate to sing the praises of Trump too much, but this, I mean, if you study history, don't you agree? This is a real, a real anomaly. This is a real uh, unicorn. Well, it's what you said, Alex. It's what we worked about. It's what millions of your listeners have heard all over the world. This is the American Revolution. I talked about it. I wrote about it 20 years ago in fiction and in blog. You made it possible. Roger Stone made it possible. I, a bunch of others. But this is a real secondary revolution. It is not, it's not filled with guns. It's not filled with hatred. It is simply a concept called change. And America is frightened because for too long, we had a... Dr. Pachinik, your, your uh, Skype degraded. I'm going to reconnect with you because it, it's totally degraded. Uh, uh, Dr. Pachinik, you're back now with a clear shot. You were breaking yeah. down the second American Revolution, how big this is. You're right. We should celebrate this more, not just to pat each other on the back, but to recognize what is successful and what has worked uh, and, and, and then deploy it further. Because I know you want to say they failed, they're over, we're beating them, you know, Trump's blitzkrieg. But, but I mean, they are involved in some counterstrikes here. So let's, let's flesh this out. Well, uh, it, it, let me put it this way. This is far bigger than just an American revolution. It's something that you and I talked about. The, the breakup of the EU is imminent. I've said it for years. Uh, Theresa May, uh, Prime Minister of England, did the smartest thing possible, came to see Trump, said that they're going to negotiate a separate agreement with Trump. Uh, Prime Minister of Japan, Abe, came to see Trump. Uh, South Korean ambassadors are coming to see Trump. What's happening now is that America has redefined its position in the world, taken out of the notion of the multilateral context, which was really not to our advantage. All the uh, membership that we had in all these uh, WTO, the United Nations, was worthless. We were spending countless numbers of billions of dollars for absolutely nothing. And Trump looked at the problem. He saw what we had to do. We had to withdraw and reconfigure ourselves into a position of power. We're not isolationists. This is not a... Uh, 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 Your Skype broke up, but I'm going to say this. If you really look at it, it's major Americana cultural expansionism. Our real power is being Americana. So all the tyrannies of the world are the ones that better be upset. And you know what, Dr. Pachinik? Tyrannies and centralized systems are upset. Uh, again, your Skype's breaking up. That's why I interrupted. Uh, now, going back to Dr. Steve Pachinik. Sorry, been interrupted by Skype. Not my fault, though. Uh, get back into this de-evolution, what's happening and what you expect. To, I mean, I, I want to believe you that we're really beating their pants off right now. But again, just part of me wants to watch my sex. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Alex. And I do apologize for the Skype. It's not interference from anybody else, but just my incapacity to run. Let, let me make it clear. This is not about uh, self-congratulation. There's nothing here where we who were part of this revolution, including the Trump family, are successful. Success really gets defined on a continuous basis. What's happened is Trump and, and Bannon and the others have understood very clearly we've taken out every civilian who has in the past or will in the future create an unnecessary war. How was that done? Well, that was done paradoxically by putting in generals and military men who've been in combat, who understand that we're wasting our men and resources on wars that make no sense, i.e., you have James Mattis, you have Kelly, you had Flynn. You have a whole group of these generals, Pompeo, who all were trained in the art of war. Now, in contrast, you had the liberals or the Obamas, the Clintons, the Bill, the Hillarys, the Madeleine Albrights, the Condoleezza Rice, all of who came out of a very soft background, which was had no uh, consideration about how you do war, how you increase it, how you begin it, how you maintain it, and how you end it. So what we had was the incompetency of civilians, not over just one presidency, two presidents, over decades. We hadn't had a president who'd been in the military since Bush Sr. and James Carter. And it wasn't an accident that under Jimmy Carter and Bush Sr., we were asked to put in more military people in order to stop wars that had occurred. 
The second part of all of this is we no longer want to be tied to financial transactions which have no benefit to us, the American people. All right, Doc, let's come back and break down this huge Trump revolution. We're 10 days in. He is delivering. This is historic. The reason I harp on the fact that Trump is delivering on every front is this is just amazing. We have seen a historical time in the last two years, and now the time we're going into is going to be even more historic. And what we have is a group trying to take over power and this huge centralized system that actually wants to empower the individual and wants you to have hope and, 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 and really wants to get back to normal human values that transcend whether you're an American or Russian, Chinese, Mexican, it doesn't matter. And when you see somebody like Stephen Bannon, who openly wants to make people so prosperous that we break the will of political correctness, and the people that really have a vision and an understanding of the really sick psychological control that the nanny state was trying to put into society. And we've got a long way to dig out, but... but the worm is turning very, very quickly. So as Pachinik was just saying, Dr. Pachinik, this isn't about, oh, look, we're having big victories. Oh, look, Trump's so great. It's about, wow, this is what it looks like when somebody really takes action and doesn't care what the other side has to say and is committed. It really is magic to see. And that's why they so over-centralized in, in the executive branch that now it's their biggest enemy as Trump can reverse everything, just copying Obama's executive orders and laws, but tweaking them. Then when they attack him, he says, wait a minute, I'm just doing what Obama did, but actually implementing it. And so what freaks me out is I'm so used to dealing with Democrats and Republican establishment types that just go off press releases and are so lazy and work like five hours a day and don't even know what they're doing themselves. They're just arrogant in their power and MSM covering up for them. And the counterattacks are so ham-fisted that it was like battling people that, you know, were mentally retarded, quite frankly. But they still had power, so it was still an adversary. Watching Trump now, I look at what he does. It's so well-researched and so well-executed. He's put the best people in charge of every area. All he's doing is restoring the operating system we were under, say, previous to 1960. That's my view, but with a high-tech overlay and with a push to really decentralize the technology, and, uh, devolve power to the states, America 2.0, and he said that in his inaugural speech. Dr. Pachenik, what was it like for you to see that inaugural speech? You know, your colleagues you talked to, other people that have been trying to keep this country free for decades and decades. Uh, is it surreal for you? Because for me, it is just bizarre to see this paradox. Well, let me just say, when I heard the speech, I cheered. I thought it was to the point, it was brief, and it was comprehensive. Was it surreal? Not really, because when somebody like you or I think about a, re a regime change, which this, which this was, and, and it's too late for the people on the left or the media or whatever you want to call it, it's too late for them to implement any other changes. All they can do is create obstructions which are not really valid. As you see the Schumers who start to cry and it's, it's disingenuous, or the blank fines who raped our government and our people from Goldman Sachs, and they're co uh, complaining. The reality is those days are over. And what we will see now is the breakup of the government, and it's beginning with the State Department, where I'd work, which I said... And what's years, crazy is hearing you and Bannon and, and others, Trump is literally doing it, he said, I'm breaking it up, get ready, and then he starts doing it. That's correct. And and the, that whole concept that I'm going to do it, and subsequently you Americans or whoever you're, wherever you're involved, you have to pay the price. No one has realized that, that particular issue, and that's what the press doesn't understand. That's what the Hillary's don't understand, the Democrats don't understand. There are consequences. The consequences have been obviated for too long under the Clintons, under the Bush, all that stuff was nonsense because it was covered up. There was a lot of covert operations. But what we've done is to bring all of the problems up to the surface. Trump has done that. And he said, OK, now analyzing these problems, this is the way to go. We're going to make the 
government smaller, which by definition should have been smaller. We're no longer going to have a million people on the Pentagon supporting a million soldiers. That's not going to work. We're no longer going to have 20,000 foreign service officers who really don't do very much. Sure. What do you make of what do you make of uh, or anything else? And yeah, we're going to take that down. So by self-definition, the people select themselves out if they think they can protest against Trump. I don't have a problem with that. That's your right. But the consequence is you can't hide behind anonymity the way the State Department officials are trying to do. They want to have their change and the counterbalance to Trump, but they don't want to be named. I would rather have them named and said, OK, you don't have to work here. We don't have to pay you for 20 years of being in the Foreign Service. I'm not sure what you've done. I'm not clear what the outcome is. And quite frankly, this is what I used to do in management. And we used to get rid of people one after another. Now, the, the system is not used to the sweeper or the cleaner. And that's really what Trump has been doing. And people like yourself or myself, we can articulate the point of view. We implement it. But then what happens? It becomes infectious. The Hillary's and the Clinton's and everybody else becomes irrelevant. What becomes relevant is that we become the focal point for England. Now the biggest problem is... No, I agree. We're now the role model all over and the dominoes. I mean, look at Le Pen. She's racing to first place in... Correct. Uh, nationalist movements are exploding. Uh, why do you have your top story? You sent it to me. Let's briefly talk about this. What does it signify that he's put... Bannon in for National Security Council, but brought the CIA back in after decades as well. And then I want to circle back around uh, to the outgoing CIA head, openly threatening Trump, unprecedented. Well, I, I wrote the article about Bannon. It's not the first time, but it's really the second time where I support a man like Stephen Bannon. He's born of the Democratic left, pro-labor, uh, pro-Democrat, came out of Norfolk, Virginia. But thanks to his own uh, desire to make something of himself, he went to Virginia Tech, then got a master's degree at Georgetown, then volunteered to go into the Navy, became an officer in the Navy, uh, was involved in surface warfare, uh, warfare, and then decided to Goldman Sachs to make money, left Goldman Sachs, and then started a business in Hollywood. Now, that's a polymath individual. To me, that's what America's about. It's no, it's not a straight road to anything. It's about Renaissance it men. I'm sorry? It's about Renaissance men. Oh, yeah, but on the other hand, it's about America. Every American, in a way, is a Renaissance person because they have the ability to decide what they want to do. They don't have to stick to one profession. They're no longer geared to be one thing, like the Foreign Service or the CIA, where you put 25 years in and then you get a pension. Those days are gone. The pensions won't be there. That's, that's the sad news for America. But the people who are entrepreneurial, like the Steve Bannons, like yourself and others, those are the ones that will flourish. Well, when you put that uncertainty into the system of being entrepreneurial, which is the basis of this country, then all kinds of things happen. Sure, Anger. let's walk through some of the headlines on your site. You point out Democrats suffer from senile dementia, claiming Putin puts words in, in Trump's head. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the women's march you've exposed. I mean, let's talk about then, if they are defeated then, what do they do? Because they've got tens of millions of people I've been out there. I don't need a psychology degree to know they're mentally ill. Well, it's not an issue. I, you know, I, I differ from you in a little way because I know the people who, who are protesting. But if you think about the protest, uh, women getting together and protesting that we are women and we want a liberated freedom or whatever, it's not relevant. It, it was so awkward and so basically inept that it didn't really address the question of change in the federal government. It's not about abortion. It's not about your rights to have a, or not have a child. It was so out of tune. It was as if they were playing an instrument in another chord in another time and another way. I agree. They're not synced up with anything. I mean, we're in the zeitgeist. Everything we're doing is like this human will to succeed and propel and invent and trailblaze and discover. And everything they do is like trying to pull us down. As a psychiatrist, what do you call that? Do they hate themselves? So they're projecting their loathing? Because I'm not being a mean person, but... No, I, I don't want to get into the psychiatric mode. What I call themselves is what I called Hillary, Condoleezza, and Madeleine Albright, inept, untutored. They were basically people who came 
out of the so-called elite schools, at either Stanford or Harvard or whatever, and they thought that was sufficient and necessary just to keep them for the rest of their life. That wasn't the case. The simple case is you can protest whatever you want, you have to articulate it, but it's not relevant to the United States because the real people who voted for Trump were exactly the people whom we've talked about and who listened to the Alex Jones. And you've said this a thousand times and hearing you and Bannon, it's like the same person. I've been talking to you 15 years now, Doc, not 12. He says well, they correct. don't get Bannon us. They I don't know, know America. They don't know who they're dealing with. They're not even in the same universe as us. That's really it. They are That's literal right. it's elitists. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. I mean, you're going to Los Angeles. I worked in Los Angeles. It's not real. I mean, there's a movie called La La Land, which is terrible, but they think... This is a representation of what they're about. It's literally not relevant to the way of life in America. Once Hollywood was relevant, it is no longer relevant because of the Internet, because of the Alex Jones, because of the webinar. So what's happening is you're seeing arcane systems disappearing in very quick time. So we're so like watching change. ships sink, basically. Well, they're, 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 not, they're not sunk completely, but they're, they're uh, getting water on board. They are sinking very rapidly. It's more kind of the death of an elephant. Could it's they reinvent the themselves if they joined with the American system of the Americana? W could they go from being historical to being historic? Yeah, that's a good point, Alex, because if you see a guy like Bannon who came out of the uh, Democratic left and came out of pro-labor and all, and switched. He didn't. He he went to the side where he understood that a real America was not about elitism. It was about work, about achievement and failure. That was not inherent in the left, where it had labor unions, where you had a steady income, where you had a pension. Those days are gone. The notion of consistency and security that's gone for the individual, for the nation. No, because we grew. And we did our best when we had to develop technology, when we had to take great risks. And that's where we are right now. Well, it's just like children. If you don't make them strive, make them learn, make them go under pressure, they turn into just demonic, spoiled brats. And America has somewhat turned into a spoiled brat, but it was not equally distributed. So, so you're being very positive today. In closing here, what are the pitfalls? What do we have to look for to make sure we secure this victory? Because... I am just in celebration mode, quite frankly, which I've never been in for 20 plus years. Like a great feeling of completion. And I know we've got more fights to come, but the fact that Trump is delivering is, is just breathtaking. It's much better than I thought it would be, but I still want to guard the victory. What do we do? Well, we have to be patient. The, the initial incision by the surgeon Trump doesn't necessarily mean that the operation successful. Like any operation where we literally are changing the metabolism and the state of the patient, which is what America's in, we have to wait for the completion of the operation. Who are the people who will implement the change? How good are they really? How effective are they? Is Trump going to monitor that? And those are the kind of things that we have to watch out for. So the revolution has just begun. But remember, in every revolution, those of us who are the flame keepers or who initiated like yourself and your people will be watching. It's not a given right now. Sure, Bannon Trump. came out and he said, keep us honest. We're fighting all these special interests. It's dizzying. Please watch our backs. Please criticize us. Don't just get behind us. He said that two weeks ago. Let me ask you this then. As a psychiatrist, but also as a doctor and as a veteran and you know all the other things you've done, looking at it from a psychiatric position, I don't see Trump as a narcissist like they say in these overblown terms they use too much. He is like about almost OCD about success, victory, piles of work, delivering on what he says he'll do. And the ultimate task is to defeat all these other elites. He sees that we're given everything they had. And so it's almost a good thing that he's hyper dominant and sees his victory like a big dog hauling us back a big deer by the neck. I mean, it's almost very dog like. I don't mean that in a, in a, in a diminutive no, word. I what you're saying. Let, let, me, let me make this very clear. Every one of us has narcissism. There's what we call malignant narcissism. There's what we call healthy narcissism. In the case of Trump right now, he is manifesting a very healthy amount of narcissism saying, look, I'm going to change, but it's not only me. Sure, but that's what I'm saying. His, I'm not a psychiatrist, but explain. I don't, I don't use the terms you use, but it seems like 
his his whole identity and will is about empowering us. He sees us as him. I mean, that's that uh, that sounds very positive, but also yeah. can have some dangerous connotations if there's setbacks. But but break it down. Well, the, the connotation when you have a leader as strong willed as Trump, you also have. Uh, the notion of the higher, and uh, I, I don't mean it uh, in a negative way about Trump, but the higher the monkey climbs, the further he falls. One of the things that Trump has to watch out for is what we call in the business idealization and devaluation. That means everyone he meets, or however great he is, the higher he goes and the higher he claims somebody else goes, the further it is possible for someone like me or others to devalue him. So there's an inherent failure issue within success, and that's something that Trump and his people have to understand, particularly Jared, Ivanka, and the Goldman Sachs boys. They can't go out of too far ahead of the, the, the course or the revolution, otherwise the revolution will come back to bite them. That's an inherent part of every revolution that I've studied, involved in. And so what we tend to do in the more effective regime changes, we lower the flame, we keep it far more quiet, and we make sure that our potential opponents can be successful in certain ways. It's not, it's not the greatest thing to make sure that we have defeated anyone. We haven't defeated anyone. These are part of America. They're, an sure, they're all part of the process. Of We're trying to empower them and hoping we can be good enough to really be worthy of this great object. Well, the point is, remember, this is just the beginning, my friend. And in the beginning, there are many things that look very, very positive. But like anything else, as you have repeatedly stated, he is only a human. He knows that. His, his capacity is limited by the fact you only have 24 hours a day. He gets tired. He has people who are beyond his family reach. He has to depend on others whose ideas are not his and have countervailing... Sure, well, I, I've talked you. to folks who've been around Trump after he's been working like 20 hours a day, the first few, and I don't want to get into it, but he, he is like literally just going in and collapsing. So he's, well, I tell you, he's really doing it, though. Well, re remember this, Alex. We have many leaders in, in the military who've also been on, on duty 24-7. They have countervailing points of view, and, and I would certainly caution or... or, or put a very pleasant uh, advice to Trump and his people to accede to those of those military generals who see things differently. In other words, don't assume that everything he does may be the only way to do it. Do understand that the people... Well, I mean, he let Mattis appoint all his own people. Same thing with Flynn and the rest of them. Let's do one more segment, and then Paul Watson's coming up from London. I'm Alex Jones. If you look at Madeleine Albright and Hillary and all these people and Michael Moore, I mean... They're like caricatures of losers, and it makes me feel bad. How did we ever get in a position where these people were ruling over us? Dr. Pachenik? Well, you have to remember that whatever was the institution is gone. Uh, how we got there, it's multi. It's a multi-level issue. It was uh, uh, pensions, it was unions, it was all kinds of covert promises and over-promises, but the reality is we into a new era where literally a businessman and an executive has taken over a company called America. Now, people say you can't run America like you run a company. That's not true. There are many things that we can do as business people where we can change the nature of our... But, I mean, company. life is a business. It's all calories. It's all numbers. It's all survival. It's all procreation. Life is a business. Well, it's a business because we began as a business. We started with a revolution called the Tea Party. Every one of our founding fathers was in the business of real estate or tobacco or cotton. And every one of our subsequent uh, entrepreneurs came out of the fact that we created, in part with England, the, revo the Industrial Revolution. We are now in the process of deciding which countries we want to do business with, which countries we do not want to do business with, which countries... Which is part of sovereignty, allies. saying America decides, like a woman, who we get in bed with. I mean, it's about basic sovereignty. That's why they're so pissed. 
Well, yeah, that's correct. Basically, what we're doing now is we're uh, negating on the notion that we've absolved ourselves of responsibility in the past, meaning we're no longer going to acquiesce to some group of 110 different nations which may or may not contribute to world peace or the, the weather or... Or Saudi Arabia the heading up the Human Rights Board, like, you know, jokes like that? I'm sorry? Saudi Arabia, you know, heading up the UN Human Rights Board, jokes well, like that. That's absurd. And, and now what's going to happen, despite the fact that Trump has businesses in Saudi Arabia, the following countries will be in serious trouble. And, and I'm not throwing that out as a threat. I'm just saying it's evident. One is Saudi Arabia. They have an unemployment rate among their youth of over 40 percent. Next is Qatar, then Dubai, United Arab, United Arab Emirates. Then you go into Turkey, which has trouble. Then you're going into Germany. Which Hold on, trouble. do five more, because this is important, on geopolitical with Dr. Steve Pachenik, who's overthrown plenty of t tyrannical regimes, who he thinks the next dominoes to fall are. I tell you, those Islamic regimes are such spoiled, rotten uh, people. They treat their people horrible. I'd love to see them fall. We'll be back. We're going to Google this or search engine this live on air, but I think Saudi Arabia has got something like 8,000 princes and the lowest level one gets like $5 million a year. I mean, I'm going from memory. We can pull it up. Just the number of princes and then what they get a year. The general public's real poor. You smart off against the government to execute you. If you're a homosexual, they execute you. And then, you know, when they have a bombing campaign, a guy flies one air mission from 20,000 feet and drops a bomb with no anti-aircraft on a village. They buy him a $300,000 Bentley and give him a, like an iron cross, basically, or Congressional Medal of Honor, you know, flying cross. I mean, I don't want to sit here and bash Saudi Arabia, but what a joke. And some made-up royalty the British created, you know, in, in, the, in the 1920s or whatever. You were getting into failed states and just talking about those. I mean, failed states different than one about to fall. But, yeah, you talk about... 40% of you know, people in Saudi Arabia being unemployed. Break that down, Dr. Pachetik, in the next few minutes, other places you think are in big trouble. Well, the biggest problem besides the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, and the Sunni countries will be China. And it's not an issue of a military confrontation. It's an issue that President Xi, who is really what we call a princeling, the son of a major revolutionary, really can't handle the economy, which is totally... Uh, mixed, uh, messed up. There, there is a huge outflow of cash that's going into the United States and elsewhere. He has a major devaluation of the yuan. He has companies that are so corrupt that they're making up numbers for the bonds that they're selling in the trillions of dollars, and he has political unrest. What that means for the United States is that we're not going to war. We simply have to stabilize and help him to stabilize his own government before he thinks that an external war can help him out. The truth of the matter is that China is both economically and politically very fragile. They have no water. They have to depend on the Himalayas and the water that goes into India. If there's going to be a war, my prediction would be that it would be between India and China over water rights because China has less than uh, over a half, uh, 500 million people have no water. Then you go into the countries in the EU. England is going to drop out. Germany now has to hold the, uh, the, 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 the basis of the foundation of the EU. France is in a terrible shape. Spain is in terrible shape. Greece is in terrible shape. Italy, Portugal, terrible shape. The one country that seems to be cleaning itself out even better than we have is Brazil. Brazil has indicted its former president, Lula, the president before that, its vice president now. And they're having a very similar nationalist, anti-globalist movement. Correct. And, and the Brazilians are lovely people. They're not aggressive. They're wonderful Catholic from Portugal. And they have effectively neutralized four of their senior people and are continuing to do that in their Congress. So I see a very optimistic future for Brazil. I do not see one for Venezuela. He should be taken out. What about the Cuba? The head of it. Argentina will come back up and other Latin American countries as well. Hopefully Chile. What but happens with Cuba? Is America will still be the uh, lodestar for most of the countries around the world. 
not because we're going to send troops, but simply because of the model that we're instituting now of an internal revolution without violence becomes a very important paradigm for people sure. all over the world. It started in Arab Spring in Egypt. It didn't succeed there because, in turn, the military had to be put in. But now what the world is going to watch is how effectively Trump and his people can can literally make change. 1776 worldwide. I'm sorry? Couldn't you call it 1776 worldwide? Yeah, I think it's a valid point. This is more significant in any ways than, well, I can't say more. It's equal to the one. It's a continuum, as you said. Because we're literally in the 21st century where the new commodity and the new uh, way of relating is through binary numbers. Sure, one sure. And zero. that original root, though, of 1776 now is into the mighty tree. Thank you, Dr. Pachenik. Steve Pachenik com. Thank Find you. his book some more there. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Audience. I'm going to come right back and introduce Paul. Plus, I got the real numbers of the Saudi princes. It's worse than I said. Stay with us.